Uh, three, two, you <laughs> can't do anything with a straight face with you. <laughs> three, two. <laughs> All right. Okay. This is the beginning of the podcast where I'm trying to do with a straight face an introduction to a very good friend, a very funny bastard. Uh, this gentleman is Mr. John Tobin. He's a Boston staple legend in the world of comedy. He was the voted the best doorman in Boston 17 years in a row. Uh, you know, he, uh, he's Irish. He fixed it. But uh, no, he is a uh, the comedy club a promoter and owner, in my opinion, in Boston and uh, kind of literally worked his way up the ranks over the years. And, you know, been, been a big fan of comedy and part of comedy and Buster for a long, long time and uh, owns Laugh Boston Comedy Club. Uh, uh, he has the Roar Comedy Club at the MGM Grand and a whole bunch of other rooms. And uh, this is all the time we have uh, because your intro took so long. Thanks for being on the show, John. <laughs> Great to be here. Paul. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Can you move down the couch? We have the next guest coming up. It's Zsa Zsa Gabor. Rickles is coming on. <laughs> Rickles. Hey, I like the Irish. I like it. Um, so we <laughs> we we have lots of laughs off 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 air, just talking and shooting the shit. And uh, you know, we've been talking. It's like let's just get on this show and have some fun and talk about comedy but also like to for viewers that maybe don't know you or don't really know a lot about the world of comedy like boston is like a central city in the development of comedy in the in the country for years but and we'll get to that in a minute but so you like i think like me were like a huge comedy kid growing up right like kind of stayed up watched it like know it all that stuff loved it i mean i i think i've seen every mash episode uh 73 times um <laughs> uh, it's it, i watch it with my father all the time we used to watch laughing uh we used to watch uh candy camera uh the gong show uh oh, God. barris and the unknown comic i mean when that, barris would do that barris would do that <laughs> dance that. yeah and then maybe he got beat up in los angeles one time and he still did the show with like a broken arm and a black eye <laughs> he got beat up like in downtown los angeles or something so um yeah i just but but certainly my my parents used to have parties down in the basement i mean this is 1977 you've got no there's no uh, i'm eight years old seven eight years old there's no internet there's no vcrs there's no nothing they used to have parties at their their converted garage uh was made into like a room with like carpet samples that they acquired from all these carpets and like mirrored <laughs> in the walls god knows what was going on down there but they'd be like 10, 12 couples, and they listen to the oldies, listen to the radio, and, and just drink at a bar set up. And, right. and you could hear the laughter. But they used to, they got the Steve Martin record, Wild and Crazy Guy. And really? I remember being at the foot of my feet pajamas, like at the foot of the stairs. I wasn't allowed to come downstairs and and just listening. And people just going crazy over. So they're listening. They're like partying downstairs and listening they're to listening comedy to records. Everybody's sitting there listen, around wow. a record, listening to the record. And then, do you remember back in the day, um, People that passed around jokes that'd be on pieces of the paper with like graphs. Yeah. And it'd be like peanuts, but it'd be dirty peanuts. It'd be Lucy doing something crazy to Linus or something, you know, and just this crazy stuff. And they pass it around. And, and so I could, so I wasn't allowed to listen to it because I was too young, but my parents went out in the backyard. I sneaked down and put the record on. Oh, wow. And just listened to it. And to me, I only knew what Steve Martin looked like. I just thought he was a guy with rabbit ears, you know, he was on the cover of that in the white tuxedo. <laughs> I didn't know he was, but just imagining, because I'm a huge fan of radio. I love radio. I always wanted to be on the radio in the worst way. And I grew up listening to AM radio. I might have been the only six year old listening to AM radio. You know and, what? Uh, You're the only other person that ever said that. And the reason for me was my mother has really bad hearing. She was born deaf in one ear and partially deaf in the other. And she would either die, she would just buy shitty hearing aids all the time, like something you buy, like, you know, you know, Walgreens or what, like, it wouldn't work. So she never, she never watched TV. Like I never watched a TV show or movie or anything or another, but she loved talk radio. And so I would go to bed around the same age, like, and hearing like, uh, Topeka, Kansas, this is Larry King, go, you know, and like all of that. And it, yeah, you know, how you doing, Larry? Just, I, how you doing, Larry? First time, get to the question, Carla. Let's go. Exactly. Like, it was so, and I remember the first time I heard that, I'm like, wow, he's rude. And I remember saying to my mother, like, why do people call in? He seems rude. Oh, I don't know. I think they like it. And it'd be like, yeah. it was, on, it was an honor to talk to Larry King. Like, you couldn't believe yeah. you were talking to Larry King. 
This guy never, is like, I never, stop. I think it was, I think it was the first time I heard somebody deal with a heckler. He goes, is there a question in here anywhere? Yeah. <laughs> you held on the line to be a wise guy enough, you know, and exactly. good use of your time. And, um, uh, <laughs> Cincinnati, Ohio. Same, right, exactly. Go. Uh, we're not talking <laughs> about cigarettes tonight. We're talking about turkey basters. <laughs> Go. <laughs> uh, remember his column in the uh, Larry King's column in the USA Today? Yeah. Um, Things on my mind. It was like the oh. laziest piece of journalism ever. <laughs> well, you know, he talks about his preparation and he'd be like, I don't ever like research the guests because I want to have just fresh in the moment questions. It's like, yeah. Right. And then okay. he made up all these fables. Like the internet really blew a cover a lot of people eventually, but he made up these fables that he grew up with Sandy Koufax and they were boyhood friends. And Sandy Koufax said, I didn't even know him. I didn't even know who he was. <laughs> but whatever. But the, uh, but the US but the USA thing was like this random, like just list of stuff, right? Like the the, the, the... my opinion, purple is the new pink. <laughs> oh right. Exactly. <laughs> Doesn't a woolly <laughs> mammoth look like a buffalo? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was like he got his he had his eight year old grandson write it for him the night before. Just, it's like, hey, uh, Larry, we need your column. Uh, you got to send it by telegraph over here. And w w when do you need it? Ten minutes. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> he calls, he calls, he calls his grandkid in. Where's the Where's the copy? I told you I need Grandpa. Don't yell at me. And everybody uh, read it because if you stayed in a hotel room, it was obligatory USA Today on your uh, on the door. You couldn't get, get to it. You could read. There was no internet. That you, that's you, how you got your news. They so, wouldn't let you out of the room. They would quiz you before you left your room. Yeah, if you exactly. Didn't read the you USA Today. You had to go back. Uh, so I, so Steve Martin. I just imagined like him on stage and just making what I envisioned to be thousands of people in a theater, like complete yeah. strangers laughing. And I just thought that was just wow. How powerful is that? That's so amazing. what was it? What was it about the the radio that drew you in that made you? Uh, because Bob Costas has a similar story. He said, you know, the way he got into broadcasting was he grew up in St. Louis and he would lie in bed at night with a transistor radio. For those not listening, that's like a li those listening who don't know what I'm talking about. It's a little yeah, box yeah. that was a radio with an antenna. And he would listen to the St. Louis Cardinal games and Jack, Bu Jack Buck would call the games. And he said he was enthralled with how Buck would describe the game. And he got more into the, the broadcast than he did the game. And he loved the game. And it was, I guess, the same thing for you. Like, what was it? You just felt like you could talk to anybody anywhere kind of thing? Yeah, it felt like, you know, and then you kind of isolate. I, you know, I'm the oldest of six, but at the time when we were growing up in Mattapan, section of Boston, mm -hmm. there were only three of us at the time, three or four of us. Uh, my parents always had foster children in the house over the years. And and my father worked construction. He worked at a liquor store two days a week. He was dead tied to do anything. My mother was a waitress at the time. So, and then, you know, my sister and I were uh, eight months apart. Uh, true Irish twins. She was premature, obviously, um, but we didn't have the same interests. And then my next closest sibling was like five, five and a half years younger than me. So I, it was really no, you know, you're just a young kid and you're just kind of like looking for some connection to the outside world. Yeah. So I just, you're almost like in a weird, you're almost like an only child, even though you're not like exactly. in a way. Exactly. Yeah. So you just found like this home, you know, this refuge in, inside your radio and just listening to, and I remember listening to W. I listened to Eddie Andelman, the Sports Huddle on WHDH Radio every Sunday night. You did not miss that. It was on from like six to ten or seven to ten. I used to tape it with a tape recorder. That's how great it was. Wow. And they do all these spooks. This before you had to identify yourself when you call. They they'd call up bars like in Texas and ask for Pop Warner, you know, and just silly stuff. <laughs> just like I just thought it was the funniest thing ever. And they had a, a fake broadcaster called Biff Bookie. And he just make up stupid sports facts and, you know, stuff like that. And they do the news report and they took the calls and it was just, it was awesome. And then WBZ, I used to listen to WBZ because uh, at night, WBZ 1030 AM goes out to 38 states on a clear night. Uh, was that when get, Bob, the, 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 you're talking about the radio station, not the, radio not station, Bob. Yeah. yeah. 38 states. I didn't know that. 38 states. Yeah. Bob Raleigh, the overnight guy used to say, yeah, we go out to 38 states plus a fishing village in Bermuda. Um, and <laughs> But they get calls from Ohio. Um, they used to do this thing called traffic, traffic on the threes. They would give the traffic even overnight at twelve oh three. They give the traffic right or one oh three. It was on the road, right? So <laughs> there's 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 a guy at the corner of North, Maine and Maple. All right, back to you. I took a call one time from Bill from Kentucky. He says, "I got a question. 
what what are you all talking about traffic in the trees what you what traffic in the trees <laughs> i mean i don't explain i don't forget that but there was a guy norm nathan on and he was great he would say i'm broadcasting live from the plush but not overly ostentatious studios of wbz radio and he was a legend and um and his wife norma nathan she was the gossip columnist of the boston herald she wrote the oh, wow. i you did not want to be in norm norma nathan's column Oh, really? Uh, oh, no, no, no. And she, because she spilled the beans. She was like, she was like the, she was that day's like. She was like that. Um, Who did Burt Lancaster play in that movie? Like the, the, the columnist that had all the power or something like that. It, famous guy. I can't remember the name, but there was a uh, head of Hopper was a woman in LA in, in Hollywood at the time back in, was the same kind of thing. Like if you got in her gossip column and she didn't like you and you were a star. You could ruin your career ruin your career i mean speaking of that i mean the but you know these media celebrities these radio and tv people in boston i can't speak for other cities but uh in the 70s in the 60s 70s and 80s uh this would be well, long before mark Wahlberg came along and the new kids and aerosmith and 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 um tom brady and but for, for it, with with few exceptions they were the they were the celebrities of this town of mm. Boston. They ran mm. the town. We didn't have any chefs. <laughs> we had one restaurant. We had no chef. You know, <laughs> chef. Hey, right. now you, you know, so they were the so I have autograph books with like Bob Lobel's autograph in it. And oh, like, Bob, yeah, I remember Bob Lobel as a kid. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And and uh, and Dick Albert, the weatherman from Channel Five. You know, yeah. yeah. Chet and Natalie were married. Uh, they were married. They were they were they were married on on. <laughs> Like there are a couple, and then they get divorced, and it was like the biggest news ever. It was like mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, you run into your parents or you're crying. I can't believe they broke up. Oh, and they you're still had to do the news together. They after they even separated, they were getting, <laughs> getting they're sitting next to each other at the anchor desk. It was just. <laughs> I, it was probably like uh, it was probably like Anchorman where they started fucking with each other's like teleprompter and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. I mean, I when I became a city council later on in life, I get Chet Curtis had moved on to another uh, in the kind of a twilight of his career, and uh, I was being interviewed by by him on NECN, and I was like in the second block about something, some piece of legislation, and I couldn't believe that I'm getting interviewed by Chet Curtis. This is like the biggest thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life. Right. So, at the commercial, they walk me in to mic me up, and I'm sitting next to Chet Curtis, and and I said. Hi, Mr. Curtis. And he said, he said, uh, hello, counselor. And, and I said, oh, geez. I said, he had a bad cold. He said, you sound, you sound awful. You get a, it sounds like you have a bad cold. And he says, nothing a couple of hot toddies in Marina Bay later on won't solve. And they go, <laughs> three, two, one, and you're on. And he goes, we're next here. Yeah, you know, and I'm sitting there laughing on the, <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> Just like, it's like, it's like, there's nothing better. You know, again, for those watching or listening, they'll know, like when you're a comedian, you headline in the city, you go in the night before, and then you'll do like local press, you'll do the local morning TV. There is nothing, and you know, I work on TV shows or whatever that are national, but there's nothing more fun than doing local television. Right. Like, and I get, like, I just uh, was doing some stuff in Connecticut for a show I had, and they usually one station I go on, they'll have a cooking segment before or after me, and they didn't. I was so bummed out. Cause I love, cause I'll start to go, I'll go over to the desk and play with the, the counter sure. and play around with the cookie set. But there's just something about it. It's like, it's like the Mary Tyler Moore show, you know, that morning that, that, you know, the witch God was such a great, that was such a great show. That was, it was so good. It was unreal. It only rivaled by the Dick Van Dyke show. Yes. And she's, she's the co-star and the star of each of them. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and just, I, I met her years ago and you I did. I, Yes, and she was at the, she was being honored at the Kennedy Library for uh, the MSPCA. She was a big animal rights person. Oh and, right, okay, I remember that. Yeah, and uh, so she so the guy who ran it invited me and my wife to go and went, and I got brought. I was like trembling. It's Mary Tyler Moore. I I did, never got a picture behind the back of a. I brought a picture with me of me standing under Mary Tyler Moore Way in Los Angeles, and I brought. Oh, a you did. He signed the back of it. Uh, you should have brought capri pants and had her sign them. Oh so, so oh, John, no. I, John, Lou, so John and I will text occasionally at late at night, 
And it's like we're each watching. We're both at the same time, same time watching a rerun of the Dick Van Dyke show, and uh, and it'll we'll we'll talk about the comedy. Then invariably we'll get to the point where we're both like going, "How hot is Mary Tyler Moore in the, in those pants?" Like, it's I was watching one episode. And I just kept watching it because she was doing something in a scene and she had to turn around a lot. So all I was like, at that point, I had no idea what the dialogue was because I was just looking at her ass. Like I was just all over. Yeah. She was like five tools. She could sing, dance, yeah. comedy. Yeah. Uh, I, she was she was amazing. I know I have the uh, the, uh, the Peloton downstairs. I, how do you know someone's on a Peloton? They'll tell you. So <laughs> when I'm talking, we have a we have a, a widescreen television in the uh, in the in the in the gym downstairs, and I'll go on it. And I don't listen to the if I'm not listening to, if it's not a podcast I don't want to listen to. I turn down the music. I don't even listen to the instructor. I just watch the screen, um, and. I'll turn on the thing, smart TV, and on consecutive channels is the Dick Van Dyke channel and the Johnny Carson channel, showing continuously shows on the loop. Uh, Wait, it, you is that on your Peloton? No, no, it's on the it's on the TV in the in, in uh, downstairs in our little workout room. Is that part of your like? Is that part of your cable not system not where cable. you live? I, a, I, I have no idea about any of this stuff, but it's like a smart yeah. television. It's like a different. It's not yeah. cable, but there's a million channels, and it, there's like '70s cinema, '80s cinema. <laughs> Like, like you would never see the light of day, but I'm watching it, right? Some, you know. <laughs> so, but I did consecutive episodes last week of the Dick Van Dyke Show. The guest stars were Don Rickles on Dick Van Dyke, and like from 1964, 65, and then yeah. the next one was Richard Dawson. Oh my God, really? I didn't see that one. Good. I mean, ah, oh, and Richard Dawson to me is like. Richard Dawson, if if it was if the match game were held today, he'd be taken out in handcuffs. I was gonna say the best and creepiest, like it was that lean in and that kiss and it's uh, like. Oh, do you have a do you have a do you have a YouTube Richard Dawson uh, uh, family family feud kisses? They last no. five minutes, five minutes, and he's like down their throats. And the funny part, like he married, he met his fourth wife, I think, <laughs> on the she was a contestant on Family Feud. He got married to her, and then. From then on, she she he was forbidden by her to kiss any other contestants. <laughs> <laughs> so if, again, for those of you watching us, you know, so Richard Dawson was. If you look at Hogan he, Hogan's Heroes, he played one of the guys. The, the 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 which, by the way, to this day, it's the '60s. So we're all, we're not even 20 years away from World War II, and they walk in and they pitch a concentration camp. Imagine show. composing something like that today. I could it, it, the, the the unmitigated gall. John, just listen to this idea. It's a slave ship, and <laughs> it's set on the ocean. All the slaves are black, but they're feel good black people. Like what? How did they get away? Like, and you know the oh, guy right. that pitched the show was the guy that did. Uh, um, uh, they did uh, who who produced um, the Godfather, uh, Albert Ruddy. Oh, really? Albert, Albert Ruddy was like a numbers cruncher guy and somehow was working or knew somebody in Hollywood. And he got he wanted to become a Hollywood producer. And he either came up with the idea or knew a guy who came up with the idea for Hogan's Heroes. And he pitched it and got it on the air. And that gave him traction in Hollywood, which then led to him knowing Robert Evans and then led to him producing The Godfather. So if you watch Hogan's Heroes at the end, you're going to always see his name. But I still wow. watch it to this day. And then on top of it, you've got Bob Crane, who was apparently some sex freak that yeah. was making like porn videos and stuff with women. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wasn't he, wasn't he murdered like in a hotel? He was murdered. Like he was bludgeoned with like a camera tripod or something like that. Yeah. Like he, they found him like whatever. And, you know, you know, a lot of it, it's like, same kind of thing happens to me when I'm on the road. A lot of crazy shit. You gotta, that's you gotta the, be careful. That's when the funny ends. That's when the funny <laughs> that's, ends. That's so funny. Yeah. I don't know how we get over that, but but like, so so Dawson played one of those guy, one of the guys in the camp, and in the feud. So people can imagine, like he's now uh, uh, overweight, leathery skin, either always tan or fake tan, pinky smoking ring, a smoking a cigarette. So literally like the classic lounge lizard guy, but he's hosting a national major national game show and would like basically borderline sexually assault 
all the female guests on the show. It was it, it, absolutely insanity. Insanity, and uh, he'd be there with Betty White and Elkie Summers, and and uh, that whole the whole crew. Uh, Larry, uh, the guy, the guy who played uh, Henry on Mash, he'd be on there a lot. Uh, oh, uh, um, Harry Potter, the, the guy who played. Oh, 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 oh uh, uh, McLean Stevenson. McLean Stevenson, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a real good idea for McLean Stevenson to hold out on the contract, huh? <laughs> I know exactly. But <laughs> I'm going to leave this this historic once in a lifetime show to have to have to have six episodes of the McLean Stevenson show, which then like went into the ether. It's ranked with Super Bowls as the most watched television show of all time. The finale. I think they had like 87 million people watch the finale. Yeah, I believe it. I had um um. <clears throat> The creator of All in the Family. Um, why is his name escaping me now? Um, yeah. yeah. And he, we were talking about creating the show. So I think you'd get a kick out of this. So, you know, they were auditioning people to play Archie. They were in the, in their studio was in Queens. And so Carol O'Connor was a working actor in New York and he gets in a cab and he's running late and he, he comes in and he goes, look, I'm going to do this, but I just, I just had this ride with this cab driver who feels like he's Archie. And I'm going to kind of do him. Is that okay? And they go, yeah, sure, whatever you want. And they did it. He did it as the Archie that we know to this day. And they were like, wow. And he literally was off of the, a guy driving a cab and the way he talked and his attitude and everything. That's amazing. And the funny thing, uh, Carol O'Connor was a staunch liberal Democrat. He played right. a character totally opposite of what his his real life was. Right. And, but And for people, you know, I, I, I love that show. That show oh, is every- so good. Yeah, people like the jerk. And well, you was- can't, and you can't even do. You can't just think about like even laughing. I, I, I want to get to that in a minute, but I want to go back. So Lear said to me, I can't remember what the episode was, but there was some episode they had reached such a peak that they had like sixty million viewers just in the New York area, and there was one like landmark show that. The commercial breaks affected the water table because everybody was going to the bathroom at the same time. Unreal. Unreal. And, but you think about that and then you mentioned laughing at the beginning and how they weaved in political, social issues into the comedy. It looked like a, it was an unbelievable show because it looked like a crazy shit show, like whatever, but it was so well crafted. And then you got all in the family and mashed and you've got, and Mary, Mary Tyler Moore, not Dick Van Dyke, but Mary Tyler Moore show. Like there, there aren't really any sitcoms that are have done that for a long time that have weaved in commentary, social. Barney Miller is a fucking great. I've been re-catching that in reruns again. It is Unreal. so good. Unreal. Uh, yeah, the, Mash. Uh, Mash was a was set in the Korean War, but it was actually a protest about the Vietnam War. Right. It was right. their protest about it, you know, and yeah. Uh, you always knew the you always knew the episode that Alan Alda directed or that Michael Landon directed in. in uh, uh, Little House on the Prairie, because they cried and everyone. So if they, if each of them cried in the episode, and you could just wait, it was like as, as sure as anything, the end, directed by Alan Alda or Michael Landon. <laughs> they always want to present themselves as vulnerable and, you know, and TF. The other guy that did like this, maybe only, the only person worse was McLean Stevenson was uh, Wayne, um, you know, he he played Wayne, Wayne Rogers. Rogers. Wayne Rogers, who left. Oh, Gary Berghoff. Yeah, yeah. Gary Berg- no, Gary Berghoff stayed, but Wayne Rogers, who played, you know, um, you know, his partner Trapper. in crime, he didn't really ever take off at, beyond that after that, I don't think. I mean, it was like a little bit, but. Yeah, no, I, um, uh, and Gary, I was in, in 2004, I was out in Iowa for John Kerry for the presidential, for the caucuses. I was out there for five days, uh, but few of us fly into, Bo- fly into Des Moines. Boston people, and we figured we're going to be put right to work in Des Moines. They sent us to the hinterlands, like the farmland of the middle of nowhere on the Illinois border, Burlington, Iowa, and all this stuff. But we went into, we the Patriots were playing Indy in the AFC Championship. So we suspended the, the games on Sunday, and we the, the caucuses are on Monday. So unbeknownst to the uh, mothership, we suspended the campaign in the other part of the state so we could watch the game. So we found this bar in Ottumwa, Iowa. Oh, that's the home of, of Ray O'Reilly. So yeah. I think it's mentioned. No, no. When you go into a town in Iowa, there's a just a old dilapidated billboard. It says, "Welcome to Ottumwa, home of the loose meat sandwich." <laughs> <laughs> I 
It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> nothing about nothing about radar arriving. Nothing at all. But and, and Gary Berghoff only had like uh, two fingers on one of his hands. Uh, so if you watch, if you watch, he always is hiding it. You will never see the thing. Uh, was he born like that? Yes. Yeah, I believe. Like, he did, did, I know. I think it may have happened in a loose meat sandwich accident. He probably was. <laughs> We I had an uncle that grew up in Providence, Italian, right? My uncle Archie had a barbershop, classic old school barbershop. All they did was talk about Red Sox. They had Playboy magazines. Only the guys went there. They have only played Frank Sarsh and Tony Bennett. He was so Italian that, like, we do that Sunday Italian family dinner, you know. All Sunday the gravy. Oh, yeah. the gravy, the gravy. And I said that to my wife, who's like a wasp. She also grew up in Providence. She's like, gravy? You mean, like, turkey gravy? No, 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 that's, that's not. This is gravy, right? Yeah. And he, so, you know, the Italians like the food. It's always the food. It's got to be fresh. It's got to be fresh. They, you know, you have the, he had like four boys. They were all like giant. They ate a ton, <laughs> but the food had to be fresh. So, you know, like the normal people, you have like a half pound of ham, half pound of cheese, turkey, salami, not them. They had a meat slicer in their basement with loaves of like, it's, it's got to be fresh. And my uncle would like cut the mortadelle and the bologna. It was my the- next door neighbor has one, has a meat slicer. He's Italian. And he makes his own sausages, and they make their own sauce. Uh, they make their own red wine. Uh, <laughs> really? And he has all a bunch of Italian guys that I'm friends with, and I just keep my mouth shut when I'm around them, generally. So I get invited to one of the houses. They, they got one of the guys, like a suburb of Boston, there was a deer in his backyard. He shot the deer with a, with a, with an, with a bow and arrow. He calls the father, and the father calls all the old Italian guys. They drag the deer out of the woods. They wait till it's dark because i think it's illegal and they drag it and they bring it into the garage they skin the whole thing and prepare it over three days so i get invited to the house there's 65 people sitting at the table 65 <laughs> and it's all the old timers on one side and all the young guys and they're all busting each other's chops like it went oh, I know. yeah and i'm just drinking my homemade wine and having my venison and i'm keeping my mouth shut because <laughs> I got nothing to contribute here, you know. Guy probably was on his toilet with a bow and arrow. He saw he's (laughs) taking a crap. He opens the opens the window, boom, and then it's like they all eat like this. I I eat like I'm going to the electric chair, right? Stuff and things, but they're all like this, tiny, but they're all like huge. (laughs) (laughs) They're eating through the whole day, the whole day, the whole night. But the um, but yeah, like that that family feud with Dawson was like a classic and and you're right about like the mary tyler moore show and lou grant and then you look at that like murderer's row of talent now like ed asner wasn't ed asner now even betty white wasn't betty white like later in her career like they just and then ted knight forget it like i mean the other thing about ted knight when he was doing caddyshack he was the only one not doing blow and uh, they would like there were there were actors asking for advances on their pay, and they'd have cocaine delivered. It looked like it looked like Bogota uh, on the on the set. And uh, he was he was because he was a trained actor. I think he went to USC. Uh, you know, he was like a trained real actor. Oh, I didn't know that. He's a good he actor, was, but I didn't know that. He was outraged, just outraged that these people would you know. So, what you so it wasn't it wasn't a stretch for his character to be outraged throughout whatever he was just he was just channeling. His actual feelings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and uh, Gavin McLeod was on that show, uh, Captain Stubing. Yeah. Uh, if you want to, like, if you just want to watch, uh, you ever turn on the Love Boat lately? Go back. No, I haven't seen it. Yeah. Good. It is the most poorly produced thing. <laughs> Even the music's now wobbling. You know, it's like, and these premises they have, but they have the guests on the show, like, I saw one with Michael J. Fox. I think it was before really? he was on Family Pies. Yes. Well, you know, you know, Stephanie Powers. Remember Stephanie Powers? Like she would show up and everything. Like it, like Robert Wagner, like who was like a hot Hollywood hunk movie star, and then slowly became like pudgy. He's a guy, and... he's a guy you don't want to be on a boat with. With <laughs> exactly. Just saying. <laughs> uh... <laughs> uh, hey, by the way, what happened to Gavin McCloud? We haven't seen Gavin McCloud since Rob, since Robert Wagner was on the show. <laughs> uh, I heard them walking out of the studio say something about going on a sailing trip the next day. I and mean, then <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. But oh, but it was like, every but every other episode was uh Charo. Charo, she'd be on. Oh my and, uh, god. She used to go. Hoochie, hoochie. She used to go on Carson. And I gotta tell you, 
like around that time, I was a young like what they. She was like, "Whoa, so that man!" Was the, that was the that was the visual Ge National Geographic. For he us. had the Kardashian ass before there was a Kardashian ass. Oh, absolutely. Think about that. That was because a natural. Put on her head, and every every other episode she was on, uh, Gofa and um, and uh, what's his name? The other the other guy, the guy with the glasses. The doctor with the glasses. The doctor. Yeah. Oh yeah. They yeah. were trying to work to get her to to get her take uh, English lessons so she'd be competent for the citizenship test. So it was always like a drama whether she was gonna was gonna pass it, you know. You know what I've been watching? I've been watching that girl. Remember that girl with Marlo oh, Thomas? Marlo Thomas. I had yeah. a thing for her, and uh, like you know, like whatever. And she um, what, what she Mary Tyler Moore threw a hat in the air. But what what was the signature thing that Marlo Thomas did? She would walk down. She'd walk down Fifth Avenue, and she would look in the window, and there was a. It was supposed to be a mannequin, but it was her, dressed like a queen. And um, there's something about that open because I live in New York and I lived in New York so long. And it's got that like late 60s, early 70s kind of gritty New York feel. Oh, and she's sure, walking yeah. down with like a really pretty hat and a dress. But like they really do a good job of like really capturing the city. It was just all street scenes. But and then it stops with her and then the queen version of her in the window like winks at her. And like that's the end of the show. And then. And then um, the she guy was that's really here, wasn't she? Yes, she was exactly the guy that's really funny. In that if you get if you ever watch it is the guy who plays her father. I don't know his name, but he's fucking hilarious because he's just this cranky like old Jewish actor. What are you doing yeah. that for? It was like it was always like that. Like every every dialogue I, I, with him was like, "What are you doing? What? Why are you putting so much salt in it?" Like and it, it was always an overreaction to everything. But another she, show that Kenny Thomas's daughter. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and uh, and Danny I Thomas. Was, had I was in I was in Turkey Turkey for two weeks back in two thousand two on this delegation trip. It's a whole long story, but we were there. We went to a place in Ankara. We went to this, Jesus, uh, surprise, surprise, a, a shish kebab place, and um, we we went in. I haven't had, I haven't had lamb since. Uh, we oh you have you just don't know there were, it. <laughs> there were pictures of Danny Thomas all over the place inside the and they said Danny what? Thomas Danny Thomas ate here. This was a big thing. The, like the guy, the owner of the place. We, we're Americans. He goes, Danny Thomas ate here. I think I might have been the only one who knew Danny Thomas was. <laughs> it's like a it's like one of those New York delis that has like every picture of anybody known or unknown who signed anyway. Exactly. To, exactly. Uh, yeah. John Jones had an orange here, had an orange muff, cranberry muffin. So did no, you like, tuxedos with tuxedos with truffles with the truffle shirt? Exactly. And they hit so you. You were there for two weeks. How was that? It was amazing. We were. Uh, it happened to coincide. It was a delegation of young political leaders and. We were from all over the country. Um, in fact, the the kid running the the guy running the House Oversight Committee on the Hunter Biden stuff, James Comer from Kentucky, is a he was on a he was one of the six people on the trip. Really, oh crazy. my god, it's so crazy. But um, yeah, we were there. You know, we toured around. We Istanbul, Ankara, Shanlufa, Gaziantep. You know, down the south. You know, towards the Iraqi border. We we recognized the first anniversary of 9-11. We were there on September 11th, 2002. Um, and we stood in a circle with U.S. Marines at like, they're like six, seven hours ahead. So like three, four, eight, we stood in a circle with U.S. Marines and for a minute of silence from mm -hmm. when the first uh, uh, plane hit. And you felt safe on that trip, like at that time, like uh, going through? For, for, some, uh, for some unknown reason, I did. We But, you know, we had to go to the Pentagon the day before the trip, uh, not the Pentagon, the State Department, and they said there's going to be a lot of media attention on you, on all of you. Um, you were to every question you were asked, you were to answer it. You were to preface your answer by saying, "I speak not as a representative of the U.S. government, but as a private citizen." And sure enough, there'd be 10, 15, 20 people, <laughs> press people. We were on TV. I still have Turkish newspapers. We're on the cover. We're sitting in throat. <laughs> but the funny thing was like. You go into some, you know, go into offices, this candy dish or whatever, uh, you know, everything was like a, it was a bowl of loose cigarettes. Like, <laughs> it was crazy, right? And every single, every single person 
mayor, governor, anybody, captain of industry in Turkey, they went to BU. They went to Boston University. <laughs> so it was really? Jamie who said to me, yeah. And so, of course, we started talking about Boston. All right. and we get on the rabbit hole. Meanwhile, we met with every human being in the country and visited every cotton factory and ate every piece of land. <laughs> and, and so it was a great trip, but it was just, it was a lot. It was a lot because yeah. you're going on their dime and they want you to, they run you around, you know? And um, so we get into the van after like the fifth day meeting and Jamie Coma from Kentucky says, John, can I ask you to do me a favor? I said, what's that? And he says, can you stop telling people you're from Boston? You're making the meetings go every 45 minutes longer than they need to be. That's classic. It was like a guy from Kansas. There was a woman from California. It was someone from Tennessee. No one was where they were from. They all went to BU, you know? Right. So look, it's hilarious. Uh, did, did you, um, you know, by the way, you mentioned Caddy. We're talking about Caddyshack uh, about five nights ago because uh, on Antenna TV Network, I watched Carson reruns and Rodney was on. And it's weird, like we're both comedy geeks, so I'm gonna geek out with you. It's like it I got chills. It was like an historic moment. It was the night he was promoting this new movie called Caddyshack. Like it had just come out. And the way he was promoting it, like he barely gave a shit about the movie because all he cared about was his, like his, you know, he was like a metronome when it when he told jokes, it was like and there's nothing better than watching Rodney do stand up and hearing Johnny like falling over in his chair. Right. And, well, they, and you know, so, this is let's face that some of the stuff is rehearsed, right? Uh, some of the stuff, it wasn't exactly all that lived. And then Carson would get ahead of him and he goes, Johnny, get ahead of me here. You get ahead of me, Johnny. You know, uh, <laughs> let's go back right, to that. Right. I remember he said, what, he was talking about his health, right? He goes, Yeah, you got to have your health, John. If you don't have your health, you have nothing gotta to help. You. Yeah, like, Carson goes, yeah. Got to have your health. Got to have your right, health. You got to have your health. Like the easiest eight minutes of it, because like you don't have to do anything with him. You're just going to sit there. You don't have to lead him. He's right. So, so he, he does said, like, yeah, he go, like, there's three or four Carson jokes about his, help. Carson lights up yeah. a cigarette and, John, and then Roddy Dangerfield lights up a cigarette and uh, Johnny goes, well, you know, these probably aren't the best things for your health. Roddy Dangerfield says, well, my dentist told me to start smoking, prevents me from chewing gum. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Caddyshack, if I remember, if I recall correctly from the book, the 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 rivalry between the the uh, the uh, what's the, the movie the, 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 the movie that Chevy came Chase with, oh, 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 the, oh. Uh, the movie with Belushi and all Animal House oh Animal House yeah like the Animal Animal House and Caddyshack had this rivalry the producers and stuff like that and Animal, right. I think Animal House was first but Caddyshack was projected to be a bomb that nobody everybody was embarrassed by it they didn't even want to really? promote it. Yeah, and they did like a they did a press uh, day at Dangerfields for the movie, and people were just despondent. They didn't want to promote it because they were just they were then it becomes so like skewed. so so you know so like I'm Ron Ronnie's sitting there and Johnny's over there and he's like you know he's doing his thing and and, uh, and then he goes like yeah, we're talking about the hell you gotta have your health John you gotta have, oh, yeah. like yeah you gotta have your health and John's just like you know he's phoning in ink because he's doing it so Ronnie does like two or three health jokes and then like you said he gets there, he goes so how's the wife john john my health it's not good i'm i'm not done john i'm not done <laughs> and he, get ahead of me. He, he get ahead of me <laughs> and then john falls over because now he's like you know the cat's out of the bag and then he goes and so he finally so he does like six seven minutes stand-up set then he sits down and he does another five or six minutes which for you know national tv and then they finally get to the and so you're in the movie, uh, and I didn't. I, I I always look at the date of what I'm watching, but I didn't remember that it, that was the time when Caddyshack premiered. And he hardly like promoted. It. He went, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're gonna do a movie on uh, just called Caddyshack. I'm like Caddyshack, and I felt like I was watching like a moon landing. Like this is yeah. and, and Rodney's like maybe this is because what you said that it was not considered a very good movie. Rodney's like, yeah, yeah, I'm in the movie there. Uh, and then he starts like rattling off names like they're like just schlubs like. Yeah, like uh, there's this kid, uh, Bill Murray, uh, Chevy Chase. Yeah, it's good. It's a, it's a good movie. It's a good movie. So you know, my doctor, John, my doctor, and he goes right. Like, he didn't give a shit about the movie. movie. Yeah, because all, like, all he really cared about was selling tickets to the next comedy club he was going to. He's go he was going to the Funny Bone in Omaha. And he had to get right. He had to, he had to fill four shows, five hundred people a show. The Chuckle Hut in Syracuse. Oh yeah. my god! Oh my god! And then there's well, that, I, uh, you know the old time television. My favorite old time television person was uh, Paul Lynn. 
And uh, I, did, I just did a show. I just produced a show at the Cape Cod Melody Tent. And the Cape Cod Melody Tent has been there forever. And they've had everybody there. But there's a poster. I'll send it to you after, the, after we do this. Uh, a Paul Lynn performed there. And I, I, oh, I took a picture of the poster. And it was like... Oh, but him on Hollywood Squares was uh, just the funniest stuff I've ever seen. And you yeah. go through... Uh, uh, I'm going to take uh, Paul for the block. Uh, it was uh, Peter Marshall. Yeah, Peter yeah. Mar well, I think his nephew or his godson was Pete Lecoq, who played for the Kansas City Royals. Uh, and so, how do you know? How do you know that? That's amazing. <laughs> oh, if I knew math and science like I know nonsense, I'd have Nobel prizes. <laughs> <or any laughs> my I mean, the amount of silly stuff that takes up my head. But uh, I'm going to take I'm going to take Paul for the block. Peter Marshall says, "Okay, Paul, um, why do Hell's Angels wear leather?" And he says. Because chiffon wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul, on a uh, boat, uh, on a boat, when a when a when a man falls all of, overboard, they yell "man overboard." Uh, what happens? What do they yell when a woman falls overboard? He says, "Full steam ahead." <laughs> it was, and you know, you forget that he was. Um, he played. He was on Bewitched. He was, and he, he was. He was, he was so good. And they were these like you look at it now, and you know th these sort of double entendre gay references and stuff like yep. that. And they were getting away with it. Like they, it, it was like it was pretty like right well, on the wasn't, surface. It wasn't like, cool to come out as gay, right? So you kind of had to, and right. he kind of had to live under this kind of thing. But yeah, they would throw these veiled little things in, and everybody knew he was. But he just couldn't announce do you, it. Like, do you remember any other stuff from, away, you know? I know from the Hollywood Squares. Do you remember any other of his answers? Like those are that's classic. Like that that was a classic show with him. He was so good. I didn't hold it, but it was him and if he didn't have the center square, it was George Goble. Um <laughs> oh, did I ever tell you the story? We may have talked about this. So George Goble was on <clears throat> one of the things, I mean, I guess, you know, I I still think the best late night television was always where the guy, the guests would stay and then there'd be some interaction with the guests. There's so much better. Oh, by the way, and, and by the way, talking about uh, talk shows, I remember watching, the, there's a show called the David Susskind show, which was out of New York. And yep. it was just, it was, it was like a, it was like a precursor to Charlie Rose years ago. Like there was no studio audience. It was just a black the dark theater. Of like studio. Dick Cabot? Uh, like, like, no, um, if you could believe it, like less pretentious and more intellectual than Dick Cavett, if you could believe it, yeah. you know, Cavett, Cavett I liked, but he was always like, he always had to show you how smart he was like in any comment that like he was like the kid in high school. You wanted to slap every once in a while, just right. shut up right. and have fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he was a good interviewer and whatever, but like, so David Susskind was a New York based. I think he was a, a, a journalist, a, a writer, uh, and then got a show. And I think it was mainly on PBS, but like, he interviewed a hitman for the mom. Simplest production. It was a big, huge, fat Italian guy in a black suit with a black shirt and a hood on. And he interviewed him for two hours, two-part show about killing people, why he kills people, how he kills them, how he feels after. And I was, I don't know, eight. And my mother had it on. And I, I was like, and I remember it to this day. It was yeah. just eerie and like compelling and so um and i don't know why i got off on that but like goble george again those listening george Gobel, very funny comedian from the midwest kind of dry he um he's on and it's the panel so bob hope was on with his golf club then he moves down then dean martin comes on well, a, lot dean martin, just, a lot of people didn't like bob hope yeah you, you, carson, you mean carson, carson didn't like bob hope Oh, really? Oh, uh, Why? I heard a story about how uh, Bob Hope brought out a gift that was wrapped uh, for Carson, and Carson didn't fall for it. Carson didn't open it. And it, it, was, a, it was a VCR that he had re-gifted to Carson. But Carson wouldn't open it up because he knew it was going to be clownish and that Hope would get the better of him, so he on purpose didn't open it up. Oh, he really? Knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did people, did he not like it because he was like, competing with him or always trying to top him or look down his nose at Johnny or something? Oh, I think, I don't think he was particularly funny. No, like, oh, no, he was at the, 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 the road show, those road 
movies, I guess, were his like claim to fame. But I've heard Conan and Letterman having a conversation about Bob Hope too. That it was that, yeah. But he, you know, he he was the, like the richest landowner, the, the the biggest landowner in the state of California. Really? Like he, oh yeah, he bought everything up, like orange groves and everything up. He, I bet he's still in the top ten. Really? Of, yeah. You know, listen, so, I, he did a, he did a great thing with USO. He's got his own. If you go to the World War II Museum in in uh, New Orleans, which is an unbelievable take, I've been there three times. Um, there's a whole the World League. War II Museum in New Orleans. It is, it's huh. breathtaking. And they wow. you take you take you through through both theaters. Uh, it's set up as like two or three floors, and it, you really need you need three or four hours in each in each theater in each side. You know. For, oh, I gotta you know, go because I, I go to New Orleans every once in a while. I gotta go. I didn't know it was. Oh, either. it is. It's stunning. It's amazing. And yeah, uh, Drew Brees actually bought one of Ted Williams's letters that he sent, like a handwritten letter he sent to might have sent to John Glenn. So he sent us and Drew Brees bought it for like a million dollars and donated it back to the museum. But wow. There's a special, there's a wing there dedicated to Bob Hope. Oh, because of everything he did. You know, Johnny liked, seemed to like, I saw him, Jack Benny was on a couple of oh, weeks yeah. ago and he seemed to have a real reverence for Jack Benny. Like, like um, that's the vibe I got anyway. I don't know if there's a without, backstory. Without- Without Benny and without Jack Parr, there's no Johnny Carson, right? I mean, it's sort of like you get this guy. Jack Parr. You know, when like Jack Parr quit his show over being censored. Do you remember that episode? They huh? they censored him over like a word, and he goes like, he was so emotional, he wore it all on his sleeve. There's still never been anybody like him because as great as Johnny is, you know, he was guarded. He was very guarded, and most said Letterman was guarded. I mean, maybe maybe um. Howard Stern isn't, but I can't think of anybody, but like Parr, like he wore it on his sleeve and if he, he would cry on camera, like, but it wasn't, it was fake and it was super like compelling to watch. And he yeah. quit the show one night. He said, I'm not doing the show anymore. And then eventually he did come back, but it was like, it's like, <laughs> he had Jonathan Winters on once, a young Jonathan Winters. Must have been this one's got to be probably late sixties. I've seen it in reruns. Go YouTube it, and he and Winters is he's actually kind of thin if you can imagine it, John. But he's got like he's got jet black hair, and he's got like a cool like you know now like, yeah yeah, and he's and and he just sits he's just sitting in a chair, one next to the just two chairs, two guys, and he just starts talking to him, and then he starts handing him props like literally a stick from the woods, and he went off and and Winters goes. Oh, so, so you know, Jonathan talks like this. And he, the minute he hands him the stick, the, the stick touches his hand like this. And he goes, oh, oh. And he, nah, nah, he goes, I'm a fairy from the woods. And he starts like going around like, and Jack Parr is like, there's nothing better than seeing the host like lose it. It's falling over. Right. And he oh, went, yeah. and then he, and then he took, there was some, like some kind of, I don't know, ribbon or something somewhere. He puts it on his head. And he starts skipping around and he's just gone and he's gone. Yeah. And um, I remember seeing him too. Once he came out, <laughs> he came out after Robin Williams and Robin Williams was a disciple of his Robin. He Robin Williams looked up to Winters. Yeah. So Winters came out as a Confederate Lieutenant dressed. <laughs> I remember that. The, like whole, the, the whole outfit, the hat. The <laughs> cape. And he, well, John, and he never broke character. And nope. he, oh my God, he was so, he was on the other night again and it was just, uh, he was promoting some movie and you could just see Carson was just like in awe of how fast this guy's mind was working. It was insane. Yeah, there, there were just some late night guests that you knew they prepared and they were ready and you didn't miss them. You know, I, uh, Bill Murray never, never mailed it in. Uh, right. Steve Martin never mailed yeah. it in. It was just, you had to watch it because they were going to do right. something totally different, unique. Right. And they well, Johnny, right, Johnny says to Johnny, he called, he would call him Johnny Winters because they hung out a lot, of, apparently. And he goes, so, so you have a farm now? He goes, yes, I do, John. I have a farm and uh, we have a lot of chickens. One rooster. He's very busy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he had those little mischievous eyes. They would like dart left and right. When yeah, he, was, yeah. like, he was almost like, like a 12, he's like cherubic face. And he goes, uh, he doesn't really crow. It's a lot, it's a lot of like, oh, 
oh, oh, he's tired. He's a tired rooster, John. And John is like, all he said is you have a farm. And he was off for three minutes. And he you could tell, it. like, Johnny, Johnny was just like, he was just along for the ride at that point. Like, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, so Goble is on. the. He's the third guest. It was Bob Hope. Dean Martin is the second guest. And then go and now Dean's out there with the this is at the stage of his career where he's wearing those big glasses, you know, like they're really thick and big like it's big and he's drink and you know, smoking and uh and he's got a maybe it's iced tea, but it's with tumbler scotch or something. Yep. And then Goble comes out and Goble's killing, you know, and he, he had that classic line, uh, did you ever feel like uh the world's a black tuxedo and you're a brown pair of shoes. I, I think I have it right. Right. And Johnny's yeah. doubled over laughing. So there's a two shot of Johnny and Goble. And then, and so Goble's sitting there and he's got a glass in his right hand, which is on the armrest of his chair. So his arm is next to the arm of Dean Martin. So on a two shot or on a single shot of Goble, you would just randomly see Dean Martin's hand come into frame with a lit cigarette and he'd flick his ashes into the drink and then pull it back out of frame. And the whole place is going crazy. And the entire country, 15 million people are in on the joke, except for one guy, Goble. And yep. Johnny is seeing it all and trying somehow not to lose his shit because, <laughs> and, then, and then Goble at one point, like he says it's some joke and it's not a really great joke. And he knows it, and he gets he's getting a huge laugh, and he's and he looks around like this. He goes like, he goes, wow, this is this is yeah, a really great it. audience." Yeah, and 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 they looks over at Dean, and Dean's like, "Yeah, yeah." And Dean's <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's so classic. It's so good. Um, did so? Did you? So you knew like okay, I mean, well, look, you city councilman, and you work at a university, and everything else. So you obviously took a path to work in traditional jobs but did you always think i mean i know you talked about like working as a doorman and comedy clubs like did you was it always in the back of your mind you were going to kind of somehow get into this world no i i just started off as a door guy by accident i was working i got out of the i went to the connecticut school of broadcasting and uh through my it was i took a through my nine-year sojourn through umass boston and higher ed uh, nine, year, nine years huh? like my nine-year march to a bachelor's degree <laughs> uh, I, you know, I had to pay my own tuition in high school. I had to pay my own tuition at UMass at Boston. So I just paid as I went and so have all these yeah. jobs. Wait, so stuff. you went to a, like, you went to a Catholic high school and you had to pay your own tuition. Yeah. Yeah. That was my, wow. I was the only, my parents were like, if you want to go, you got to pay for it. I mean, wow. it, was, it was 13, I think it was 1300 when I started and it was like but, 1700 when I get out. But, yeah, but you know, still I worked like, at Fenway Park as a vendor you know, worked in a deli, worked, I worked everywhere just to cobble it together. Um, what was it like working as a vendor in Fenway Park? Oh, did you, it was did you get your balls park. busted? No, it was, I worked in 86. I worked 86 and half of 87. So I'm there for the 86 season. <laughs> wow. And, um, yeah. And it's just magical, right? They clinch against Toronto at home. They won the AL East. They clinch at home. I'll never forget it. And it was just, and it just started progressing. Now we get into the playoffs. And, but you quickly realize when you're a vendor, Fenway, so they, you'd come in and they, you'd come in, check in, and, uh, you know, they'd see you, they get, you get a tuna fish sandwich or a chicken salad sandwich pre wrapped and a Coke, and you sit behind, sit behind home plate and watch batting practice uh, wow. before the games opened. And then there'd be, I mean, There'd be times where I just take a, I coach a T-ball team. I would take a duffel bag out into left field and, and come home with 10 foul balls. Like I was the only wow. T-ball team that used major league baseball, you know? <laughs> um, it was, and we give game balls like rip, ba baseballs, you know? Uh, <laughs> it was so much fun. And uh, so they go to the, they go to the, they go to the playoffs. So obviously they, they beat the angels. Um, and now they're playing the Mets and the, First two games were on the road. Red Sox went up two nothing the night. We find out through the grapevine that Harry M. Stevens, who has the contract for Fenway, also has a contract for Shea. So wait, wait you mean like the food vendor? The vendor, food. yeah. Okay. So, long story short, we found six of us, uh, 
four vendors plus two vendors. We bought their shirts and their aprons and hats. We drove down to my friend John Sullivan's father's Plymouth Voyager. Most of it. We told them we were going to Providence College to visit a friend. I was a senior in high school. I told my mother I was going to the game, but some some people didn't tell the truth, right, rightfully so. <laughs> and we left at noontime on Saturday of game six. That game was Saturday night. We drove down to the parking lot. Now, the difference was the, the vendors sold out in the parking lot of the old Shea. So they were out in the park. They were working the parking lot. They'd go in and out of the oh, stadium. You mean, the you mean they had, they had, they had like booths or something set up in the parking lot for the, for well, the no, tailgaters? You go, you go with a, a tray of Cokes and you, you, you just Oh, you're up. walking around there like you're walking in the stadium. Got it, yeah. got it, got it. Okay. So we put on the shirts. The shirts were a little more red. They had a little bit more orange, uh, but ours were red, aprons, hats. And in the second inning, we walked in, we walked right through the gates into the stadium. And so now we're in, and the Sox are already up, I think, one nothing or two nothing uh, in the second inning of that game. So here they are. They're going to win the freaking World Series. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we were uh, five of us, not, in, they're not the driver, were completely annihilated drunk because we, we <laughs> drank Bud Weiss, Bud Heavies the whole way down. Um, Bud Heavies, I love it. Sanity. And so, that's uh, when drinking and driving was a sport, you know. Yeah, like, he didn't. No, Sully, so he, he didn't. He wasn't drinking. Thank God. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. We got to a fight in a Burger King in Connecticut. <laughs> it's a crazy thing. We're fighting each other. It's stupid. So anyway, we get into. So we were sitting behind Howard Johnson's family, but he played third, I think, for the Mets. Yeah, yeah. But we were moving all of the stadium because once we were discovered as Red Sox fans, it was a nasty crowd in there that night. Nasty, and uh, so the Red Sox, you know, yeah, they, they're going to win the thing. They're going to win the World Series. It's 5-3. They've already announced Hurst as the MVP. We're going to watch them win the World Series at that time for the first time in 68 years. This is this is it. And I've been through 78 with Bucky Dent. And, mm-hmm. yep. and I'm just like, I didn't, I was too young for the heartbreak of 75, you know, but um so now where are you are you sitting somewhere or is it you are you sitting all over with different seats and standing you're not working room. you're not working anything you're oh just no we sitting. put everything we had everything in bags they didn't take your bags or anything we had everything in a duffel bags and so they're gonna win it and then obviously we know what happens the thing i've never heard anything louder in my entire life that noise from that and i've been to super bowls shea stadium when mookie uh wilson uh cross home plate that's unbelievable yeah and, and we so we get out to the, the, it, the it's bedlam and now they're beating the bejesus out of some Boston people. And so we just keep our heads down. We get out to the car. We're not going anywhere. It's gridlock. The noise, the thing, people honking their horns. It's, all, you know. And so we're sitting there. We're sitting in the exact same spots. I was sitting back left of the Plymouth Voyage, the same spots that we drove down in. And I don't know who started crying first, but it became uh, a, a symphony of sniffles. Really? Oh, so we're all crying. Oh, God. And now we have Massachusetts license plates. So the crowd descends on the Plymouth Voyager and they start rocking the car. Oh, and I'm like, geez. oh my God, we, we lost and now we're going to die. Now we're going to die. <laughs> so we end up, we eventually get out of there. We can't find a hotel where, where no one put any thought into this because they were supposed to play the, they were supposed to play Sunday night, game seven. Right. And found a motel like 25 miles into Long Island that they, I think they rented by the hour. You can hear the knocks. <laughs> Time's up. You know, in vibrating beds. So six of us piled into this room. Let's go. Move it out. And we woke up in the morning, Sunday morning. We're hungover, depressed. How'd you get away from the? How'd you get away from the rocking car thing? Did you just kind of slowly? I don't know. I think we just, yeah, I just sort of guided away, or maybe a cop saw us or whatever. But we wow, we get we and we're gonna stay, but we're gonna go back for game seven. And game it was torrential rains, so we just drove. You were game seven? No, no, game seven got rained out. They didn't play game seven until Monday night. Right, so, I uh, went to that game seven, and uh, and I was no, sitting. I had, to be back, and, I had to be back to school. Uh, and the Red well, Sox were winning, that, they were winning that game. I know, I know, but at like that point, because we had had the sh- literally the champagne like off the bottle on game six, and it was like, what? It was like, oh, uh, like literally, I remember taking the foil and like putting it back, and then putting it back in the refrigerator, thinking if I did that, I would reverse time, and we could yeah. redo this somehow, right? So game seven, we're like, but I refuse to let myself, because like you said, Bucky Dent, whatever, I refuse to let myself get whatever. And then sure enough, it starts to whatever. <laughs> but insult to injury, we're sitting in a section and some idiot Red Sox fan in our section, which is basically like four Red Sox fans and 200 Mets fans, 
decides to start mouthing off. And the guy's sitting like two rows away, just a few seats away from us. And they start, and rightfully so, they would have done this in Boston. The Met fans start spraying the guy with beer. And we're getting sprayed with beer. And we're losing now. And we lost the night before. And it was like, you know, it just killed me now. Just like, this can't get any worse. It just can't. The, the worst and best part of that thing was, uh, remember Daryl Strawberry hit a home run that's still going. It's over like Cuba <laughs> space right now. And uh, and the, uh, that was off of Al Nippa. And he styled it around the base. It took him about five minutes to go around the bases. <laughs> and I'll never, the 87 was miserable. They started out, Clemens held out. Uh, he held oh, out. I forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot about that. People were just upset and so still hung over from the season and pissed and sad. And the Red Sox played the Mets like in the second or third exhibition that game that year. And Al Nippa faced Daryl Strawberry and hit him right in the ribs. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's like, like great. Five minutes later, I'm getting my I'm getting my payback. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> do you remember where Bucky Dent? Where were you when that happened? Were you just home watching it, or they let it? I went to St. Gregory's in Dorchester. I was in fourth grade, and they school used to get out at like two thirty. They let us out of school. They, I can think of that game started at two oh five. They let they let everybody out of school an hour early so you could be home to watch the game. Can, wow. can you believe that? That's amazing. Yeah. Unbelievable. That's amazing. So, yeah, was, my father was working working construction. I was downstairs in my parents' finished basement on the recliner. Yeah. My father was in and they lost. And I'm sitting there in tears. And my mother calls down. She says, "John, it's supper." And I'm like, "I don't want to come up." She goes, "It's not my fault. <laughs> you lost. Get up here." <laughs> Like zero sympathy, like it, nothing, you know. I tell right. you, it was, my father put floors in for a living, and my parents had a small furniture store, floor, furniture and floor covering. So his distributor, a couple of times a summer, would give him like four tickets to Red Sox games. And I remember there was a big deal. Like we go up from Providence, we go to a game, and then I, I was ex- just as excited about the game, but I was excited about the game, but just as excited about we'd stop at Bickford's. Remember Bickford's on the way back. And I get like waffles and ice cream at like midnight, just stuff in my face. It was like I was I was more excited about that than the. I mean, I love baseball, but like I remember that like it was just. Remember the joke was it, every, like uh, during every Red Sox game, like the uh, the winner would win. You, someone in the crowd would win uh, uh, a free breakfast for t- uh, uh, two, and the joke was second prize was two free breakfasts at Bickford's. <laughs> I forgot about that. It was like it was it was like the precursor to uh, Waffle House. Like it was. Oh like, yeah, it was big. Like, was fine dining in Boston back then. And I remember, like one night, there was like two different fights going. One was like a couple fight. You're an asshole! Like she slapped him, and then put a cigarette out on his arm. And my father's like, "Okay, we're leaving." There it was like it was like fight night. It was like dinner and a show. Whenever you walked in there, it was. I told my father, I, I, I didn't tell my father, I told him this during his eulogy, I uh, passed away about seven or eight years ago, and I told this in the story, but my father brought me to my first Red Sox game, like in 1977, it was, I, it was Dennis Eckersley's first start after there was no, uh, there was no hitter for the, for the, for the Cleveland baseball team, um, <laughs> and so, uh, so I was excited, with the, I mean, they, back then, they'd only draw like 19, 20,000 fans. Yeah. So we're late getting the game. my father was late getting home. I brought my glove and we're sitting in right field virtually by ourselves, like in section seven, like under the grandstand. My father's got a beer and he's sitting on the aisle. I'm sitting next to him. There's nobody sitting around us. And a foul ball comes and goes about four sections away from us. So I stand up and I start waving. And my father, he's got one hand on his beard. He was, gig- he was huge, right? He's one hand on his beard. He takes his other huge paw, his right hand, and puts it on my bony little shoulder and presses me back in the seat. He says, sit down. You look like an asshole. <laughs> he, says, he says, besides, the game's not even on TV. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, <all> right? <laughs> so, so about four or five years later, we used to go to, they have double headers, the regular double headers. You know, you know, none of those separate admission, the double header. So we went to a oh, double header, three or four of our friends against the Kansas City Royals. And um we go 
and the place is empty and out the second game. It's like the ninth inning, eighth and ninth inning, the second game is hardly anybody in the stands. So we go sit right behind home. We're right behind home plate. So uh, in between innings, I get a dime. There was a payphone down the bottom of the ramp of the, when you come into Fenway. And I call my house and my father and says, hello. I said, dad, he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm a phone talk. He goes, what do you want? And I said, are you watching the Red Sox game? He says, no. And I said, turn it on. He says, all right, hang the phone. As soon as the inning comes back, I start waving behind home plate. <laughs> I get home two hours later. My father's reading the paper. He looks at me. He says, you still look like an asshole. <laughs> That's the best. Oh, my God. That five, five year callback. Ah, nice. He still had you. Goes right back to the paper. Um, yeah. Hey, tell them. Um, we got to do another one of these. There's so much stuff that we got to talk about, but like, I tell, um, I want, let's tell the story about, um, when you were, didn't you, like you were a doorman, but you also, we like introducing shows or something to, you told me a yeah, story. Dick, a eventually. Stories. Yeah. Dick. Yeah. How would you like to introduce the uh, comics? D like, Dick Doherty. There's this guy, sorry. Dick Doherty that like kind of had, was like, the, was he called himself the, Godfather of Boston comedy is that what he called himself? I remember. Yeah. Well, the legend, yeah. comes up the legend, the Godfather. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he gave me my start. I, I'm so grateful to that. But man, I always said I had to wait for Dick to pass away uh, so I could write the book, and he, he died last year. So I guess I'm on the clock. Um, <laughs> but, uh, How did you he, connect with him? I forget. How did you start to get into that? I world? was I I graduated from the Connecticut School of Broadcasting from its intense <laughs> eight month program. And I got a job at I got a job at Kiss 108. A buddy of mine, Hank Morse, a radio guy forever. We dated friends, and so I got to meet him through that. And it's the same thing. I was I was psyched to meet Hank because I hear Hank on the radio. And uh, Kiss 108 back in the day was the the station. It was like the number one billing radio station in the country. Really? Uh, I didn't oh know. yeah. I mean, you think Dale Dorman, Sonny Joe White, uh, Matt Siegel. Uh, Lisa Lips. I mean, Maddie was... Siegel of like who just retired. That's Se yes. Maddie Siegel. Wow. Yes. I mean, he was a, a powerhouse, right? Maddie in the morning. Everybody yeah. listened to that. Yeah. And uh, so I got hired to run the 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 FM the AM station in the back. Uh, it was AM fourteen thirty, the music of your life. <laughs> and uh, and I'd have to play the commercials on the, uh, all the music. It was all big band music. It would play on satellite, and I'd have to play the commercials. And they would let me do the weather and news at four o'clock. Like I said, wow. seven people who listened, you know. Yeah, but show. for a kid that, you know, this is why oh, I was, I was like, you know, talk, right, I right. Go, like, I go hang around with the overnight jocks in their, in their uh, Vinnie Peruzzi and Ed McMahon. They were so great to me. But part of my job was if I worked till eight o'clock in the morning, particularly, I had to go open the door for Maddie's guests that were coming on. All right. So. Dick Doherty comes in, and my parents had to go see Dick Doherty when they were dating and, and first married. Wow, and, uh, he was so like, it's the like a celebrity, and a celebrity to you, like he's coming through the door, right? Yeah, and Dick was Dick was you know pretty banged up for I think most of the seventies and eighties. He got himself clean, and uh, and he helped. A, Dick helped a lot of people, a lot, mm. including a ton of comics get clean. Mm. Uh, but he started opening up comedy clubs. And so I just introduced myself to him. I told him my parents used to go watch him all the time. And he's, how would you like to work in my club? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> so I, like the next week I'm working, I'm doing the door at Light Ships, which is a boat next to the Children's Museum. And it was like, I worked there seven nights a week. It was, wow. it was, I, so I just fell into it, you know, and then eventually and did you, you did you, did you, and you went on stage and like introduced the acts, right? At some I point. I mean, introduce the first comic and then go up between the second and third comic and talk about the dinner and show package. <laughs> You're in show business, baby. I did the dinner and show package one time, and Tony V is the headliner. And I'm going to, I do the thing about the chicken, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, okay, who's ready to be a headliner? And Tony's walking towards me. There's 300 people inside the club. Right. Right. And for those listening, Tony V, major headliner in Boston, hilariously funny guy, awesome. uh, great, great guy, nice guy. But go ahead, great mentor, great, you know. And so opened up for Burr at Fenway Park. That's how much that's how much Burr reveres him, you know. And uh, he's walking towards me, and I completely blank on his name. <laughs> All right, is your headliner 
He certainly needs no introduction. There he is. <laughs> and he's not going to get one. <laughs> and like ran off the stage, you know. But yeah, just started like, I, I just, I kind of hit that, you know, Boston comedy. You know, DePaulo left and Wendy Liebman left like in the late 80s, David Cross. And there was a little bit of a lull. And then it, you know, obviously there was the Mount, you know, the Mount Rushmore times two in Boston. Yeah. But, but then you got this new crop, you know, uh, Fitzsimmons and, mm. uh, and Tom Cotter. And, mm. uh, I just Gary saw Cotter. Tom and, yeah, Tom and Tom Cotter and I were just on a show in New York together the other night. Rhode Island we, guy, right? Yeah. Uh, another Rhode Island guy. And we used to work at, uh, uh, what's his name charlie hall's room you know he was charlie hall was kind of like the godfather of Island comedy but you know you mentioned sort of like uh nick DiPaolo, and you know when i nick was like a very established headliner in new york when i was just starting out and like i remember what and he just reminded me of every one of my italian relatives and you know both new england guys you know and so sarcastic and he goes so you know this city new york he goes you know you have the cigarettes you know I, I can't, I got the, I just went out, I got a, like a $2,000 mattress. It's like, you know, it's beautiful. You can't, I can't sleep. I'm walking down the street. I go, hey, these homeless people, he would, at the time people would call them bums. Hey, the guy's like uh, sleeping like a baby is using a Heineken bottle for a pillow. He goes, <laughs> it says return five cents and stamped in his head. He goes, it's just, and then he goes, uh, and then they had another joke. I'd always say, so, yeah, I go on the road a lot. I stay in these hotels. I got to call down. Hey, listen, uh, I turned the air conditioner on. Uh, I think there's been a mistake. Can somebody take this jet engine out of my room, please? <laughs> <laughs> I had him for consecutive shows in Boston five, six, seven years ago. I get him in Lexington at the theater and then the Cabot and Beverly at the theater. Consecutive nights. So I... I go pull up to the back and him and another woman are smoking cigarettes out in the back of the green room. And Kendra Cunningham, I don't know if you know Kendra from she's mm -hmm. from Boston, she lives in New York. Mm -hmm. She was on the show too. And so she wasn't smoking. So I they think I never met this woman. It turns out it's Nick's wife. I had never met his wife. And they've been married for like, you know, at the time, 22 years or whatever. So we're talking, talking in the green room, and he's just got us dying. He says, Where's the men's room? So I direct him to the men's room. And I see him as he walks away. He's walking very gingerly, like he had broken legs or something, right? Yeah. So he gets out of like psycho. I said to his wife, I said, is, is Nick all right? And she said, oh, uh, I'll let him tell you. But uh, he had uh, he had a hemorrhoidectomy. <laughs> I'm like, what? She goes, let him tell you. <laughs> so I said, uh, Nick, uh, your wife just tells me about your surgery. He goes, <laughs> Let me tell you about this. <laughs> and he goes on this 15 minute rant about the thing. And he says, They lay me down on a table upside down and they're pulling these things like sausages out of my rear end. And he says, And they're snipping them and they're stuffing them back up on my ass. And I said, I said, Nick, that sounds primitive. He says, Primitive. That's the word. It was primitive. He says, I'm afraid to eat because I don't want to go to the bathroom. I got to take a tub. He says, I'm so. She, it turns out she was with him because she had to drive him. He was oh my god! Cry. He had to sit like on a bag of ice. Oh god! And so and it happened like three weeks earlier, the surgery. But it was like and he's still like. So I went to my parents' house. Went to my parents' house earlier today to go visit them. I sat on their white couch. I got up. It looked like the inside of JFK's limo. <laughs> I'm just like what? <laughs> like we're down, we're in convulsions, laughing. Oh the next god. night, I'm in the wings with them at, at the cabin. He says, "Ah." Uh, Hey, that hemorrhoid shit was pretty good, huh? I said, <laughs> yeah. I said, it's all I've been telling people all day. He <laughs> says, I'm opening up with it tonight. <laughs> I remember going on Tough Crowd with him. And it was hard to keep a straight, like, not that you're not, that anybody was trying to keep a straight face. But it was, he, I would just, like, he would just start going, right? And we had, like, commercial breaks or whatever. But, like, we were blowing through the commercial breaks because he just would start on a rant. And I would just, and you know, you're supposed to participate and jump yeah. in. And I ended up becoming like a spectator, just laughing my ass off because, you know, when he starts to go like that, you know? Oh, when he and, goes, yeah, there's no stopping him. Oh there's my no God. Hey, t yeah. tell, um, we got to, we talked about the Mount Rushmore, you know, of Con Sweeney, Kenny Rogerson, Kevin Knox, uh, Don Gavin, who we are both revere, but like, 
you yeah. we both have Gavin stories, but you've got like some amazing ones. But the one the one you were telling me recently about um some guy opens up for him and doesn't really yeah, we're get in it. Norwood. We're in Norwood, this crummy little club downstairs uh from this restaurant in Norwood. There'd be 300 people up singing karaoke upstairs, and there'd be like 42 people in the room downstairs in the comedy room. And so, uh, but anyway, it was like off the beaten path. It was on Route 1, but it was off the beaten path. No one knew what was there. But Gavin's there, and Gavin's from the area. Like, I grew up on the same, I grew up on the same street in West Roxbury as Gav did. Uh, we went to the same high school, obviously, a few years apart. Yeah. Uh, so, but I used to go see when I when I was a comedy fan before I started working in the clubs. I'd go to Nick's comedy. But my very first comedy show I ever saw was in 1986. Was a junior in high school, and it was it was uh, Kevin Knox, DJ Hazard, Don Gavin, and Sweeney came off the street to do a guestie. Wow! We, I was with my friend Gary Diamond and his brother Peter. I remember walking back to the with the car. We had never seen anything. It changed our lives. Yeah, never yeah. seen anything like that in our entire mm. lives. Mm. And um, so I, I, you know, I oh, had always like, a, and it's Gavin was just like magic to me. So yeah, long story short, but now this is about four or five years after I meet him and we're running this club in, in Norwood. And uh, he's got a ton of family and friends there and people who know him and stuff. And uh, so there's like 150 people in the show on Friday night and sold out. And so this guy, from Western Mass. His first name was Chris. I won't say his last name. I still remember his last name. Uh, you know, cerebral guy, you know, political point of view, kind of mm. like, you know, yeah, yeah. And he, up on the soapbox a little bit, but yeah, he's, yeah. He's not he's, exactly a Don Gavin cup of tea guy. Like, not uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, says to, he says to Gab, he says, uh, he says, uh, Don, how would you like me to introduce you? Gab yeah, says, I just, just say, just go back from Vegas. That's Don Gavin. That's it, you know? All right. So Chris, o, my parents were there actually. And Chris O'Carroll finished his set. It was, it was dreadful. And um, it was bad. And he says, all right, well, that's, a, that's enough of my time. I, uh, the next uh, person <clears throat> has worked with me many times. Oh. <laughs> has worked with me many times. And, uh, Gab is, I'll never, Gab's near the front door of the, near the stage, and he looks down at me. He's got a cocktail in his hand. And he looks down at me, he goes, like this. <laughs> he, gives you, he gives you the eyebrow, <laughs> the stink <laughs> eye. Yeah. I asked him how we want to be introduced, and uh, he said, yeah, he just got from Vegas. And I'm not sure if he was there, you know, doing drugs or what, hanging out with hookers, but, uh, oh, you know, uh, here he is, Don Gavin. Gavin gets, Gavin is pissed. Mm. He's embarrassed him in front of his family and friends and stuff like that. And, you know, yeah, yeah. Said, Gav says, well, thank you, middle guy. <laughs> he says, uh, he says uh, your introduction, much like the rest of your act, was not funny. But anyway, I proceed. So then like midway through the set, like yeah, it was only time <laughs> Gav tried a new joke. It's the only time I've ever seen he bombed the joke. The joke didn't go. He says, okay, enough of middle guy shit. Enough of middle guys. <laughs> so he goes back to my stuff. So uh, the next night, Saturday night, I'm there taking to, we're getting ready for the show to start. And the guy, Chris, is already at the back end of the bar in the room. And Gav comes down the stairs and he says to me, he says, I, has middle guy arrived yet? And I said, uh, yeah. I said, he's down at the end of the bar. He says, okay. I'm gonna have a little, he goes, I'm going to have a little, I'm going to have a little chat. So naturally i find myself something to do you know yes. like wipe the table <laughs> right, yeah. right like, underneath his feet yeah uh, yeah i'm just like i'm over here you know <laughs> oh don looks like you dropped a quarter don't let me interrupt you yeah. i find myself in the, so i hear the so he goes up and he goes he goes right in his face he says uh middle guy last night prior to the show when you asked how to introduce introduce me and i i told you just to go back from vegas and you had to make your remarks about did you think that was funny like, did you do that me for shits and giggles? Did you? And guy Chris says, uh, he says, oh, I was just trying to be funny. He goes, yeah, not funny. Just like you, you're not funny. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, and the guy Chris says, uh, uh, I've had enough of this conversation. Gav says, uh, uh, let me uh, let me educate you. A conversation is a dialogue 
between two people. <laughs> this is not a dialogue. I'm telling you to do your act tonight. Don't even say my fucking name and get the fuck out of here. He goes, and I guarantee you, this is the last night you ever work in this region ever again. <laughs> and the guy, Chris, said, we'll see about that. And he goes, oh yeah, okay. That was the that was like 1994, 1995. It's the very last time I ever saw that guy ever again. And, ever again. And this, and this comes from one of the biggest promoters in the region now. <laughs> I never. Just, I think it was. It was like he was buried. It was like he was thrown in the river, in the Boston River. I think he, on his way out to Western Mass, said, "This is not for me. I can't do this." I think he retired <laughs> that night. <laughs> He's still in therapy. Oh my god! So, all right, listen, we got to do another one of these soon because there's oh, like, this it. is like uh, we could just we could just talk about sitcoms from 1972 to 74 and do two hours. Like uh, there's just so much to talk about. Um, this has been really amazing and fun. Uh, John Tobin, uh, owner of Laugh Boston, promoter in Boston. Um, great guy, Irish guy, a Catholic guy, a father, uh, a good humanitarian. Um, right. and, and, and does, and does Don Gavin better than Don Gavin does Don Gavin. 